This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Carverline. When you think of the Galapagos Islands, you probably think of Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution. But the Galapagos is still a very real presence in modern world. On our show today, we have Dr. Bob Rothman, professor of biology at the Rochester Institute of Technology, who's been to the Galapagos several times, and we'll talk about its role in the modern world. So you've been to Galapagos... Actually, probably, 24 times. 24 times, 24 okay. times, and I have a 25th trip planned for students in January. Right, so you, you go like once a year or twice a year? Usually once a year. I take right. students there. I've been doing that since 1990. Okay, so could you give us an overview of, I mean, everyone kind of knows of the Galapagos in a general way, but... So, so the, the Galapagos is a cluster of volcanic islands. They have never been connected to the mainland. They're 600 miles off the coast of South America. Uh, they straddle the equator. Uh, since 1832, they have been owned by Ecuador. Okay. There are probably 13 or so major islands, a bunch of smaller islands, and even more smaller islets and rocks, many of which have names, many of which don't. The islands harbor a, a, a collection of mostly endemic uh, birds and reptiles, and they, have been vi- they, were, they were discovered in 1835, and they have been visited by pirates and whalers and sealers, and finally in 1835 by Charles Darwin. Mm-hmm. And the things that Darwin saw there were key to his uh, developing theory of evolution. On several occasions later in life, he listed the three major uh, factors on the voyage of the Beagle that led him to the theory of evolution, and he ranked the Galapagos as one of the most important. Part of the reason why you have such a good example in terms of evolutionary biology is because of its oscillation, right? Because of its isolation. Um Island biogeography has a, an important role in in the study of evolution because uh, island ecosystems tend to be very simple, and therefore you can see the see uh, interactions and relationships and behaviors and such that you would find very difficult to see or understand on the mainland. I have been to the rainforest in Ecuador three times, and I have thousands of photographs. And I have never, ever once given a talk about those trips or shown those pictures to anybody because you just can't wrap your brain around it. It's just too complex. It's just too complex. It's too big. You, you, you cannot come away after a week's visit and tell a comprehensive story about what you saw other than to point to this plant the natives used for this and that plant they use, you know, they extract a poison and, you know, uh, for hunting. You, you, ju- you just can't come away with a coherent story. Yet you go to the Galapagos, and within a week, you can see enough to actually tell a coherent story more than, you know, this is a marine iguana, that's a tortoise, uh, this is Bartolome Island. You can actually tell a cohesive story about what's going on there, you know, what, what the relationships are, what the behaviors are. So I would assume that because uh, an island system like Galapagos is, is kind of a simpler ecosystem, it's also more fragile? It's very fragile, and uh, that has certainly been one of the key issues in preserving the islands. In many respects, people tend to think of Hawaii as a tropical paradise, but in reality, Mm -hmm. it's an ecological nightmare. Uh, There was a time when the Hawaiian islands were just as interesting, had just as many uh, endemic plants and animals as the Galapagos. The big difference is that there's lots of water in Hawaii, and Hawaii is relatively easy to live in, and therefore they have been settled you know, for millennia. Right. Whereas the Galapagos are really difficult to live in, and it's only been within the, the latter part of the 20th century that people have been able to live there at all in any great numbers, and it's extremely difficult and expensive because everything has to be imported from the mainland. Right, so things like water have to be brought in. There's, there's some natural supplies, but yeah, water is you know, just you know, kind of the least of the issues. <laughs> right. The Galapagos is kind of one of those sites that a lot of people want to put on their bucket list in order right. to see, and, and there, it obviously does have kind of a thriving ecotourism 
area. How do they balance this? I mean, how do they balance the stress of a whole bunch of visitors coming while preserving that ecology? Well, you know, it's difficult. Um, I, I guess if you're going to have a problem, ecotourism is not a bad problem to have. Okay. The waters around the Galapagos are very rich uh, in fish, uh, particularly lobster, uh, sea cucumber. If it wasn't for ecotour- the fact that ecotourism brought in lots of money, uh, there would probably be little impetus for the government to try and preserve the ecosystem. The population in the Galapagos, there are three towns in the Galapagos, and then one smaller village um, on one of the islands. So three of the islands have inhabitants. There, are, I, I think there are over 20,000 people living in the Galapagos okay. right now. Many of them came there for fishing. But the tourism kind of provides a counterbalance. It does bring in money to the islands. Um, it also creates a population around the world that is interested in the islands and okay. you know, pays attention so they, they can bring a certain amount of pressure to bear. Uh, but now tourism has become uh, an issue. Most of the tourism is has been yacht-based, and there are more and more and more boats there every year. Uh, now land-based tourism has become a big thing. Uh, the boats bring people, but the boats also bring pollution. The more right. people, you know, the more right. boats out there, the more the more pollution. Uh, the islands are heavily managed by the National Park Service. Uh, so they very strictly regulate the places where boats can go and the number of tourists that can be there at the same time. Mm-hmm. In my early years on the trip, you'd get there and the guide would ask you, so where, what would you like to see? Where would you like to go? And you could do just about anything you wanted within the traveling range of the boat. Right. And, you know, there, there are different different boats. We used to go on pretty small boats that didn't get that far. Uh, then later on you would have an assigned itinerary, but you could ask, could we go to Island X instead of Y? The answer would be, well, let's check with the park. And most of the time they'd say, yeah, you can do that. And now it's very rigid. You, know, it's you, very have, you, have, you have an itinerary and that's it. No, no juggling. Having gone 24 times, uh, you obviously think it's worth it. Yes, I think so. Uh, what do you think would be, I mean, for someone who might be interested in it, what do you think Kind of the biggest benefit. Why? Why should they go? Why should you go? It is a nature experience like you can't imagine. Uh, the animals are numerous. Uh, they're, they're not tame. People call them tame, but they have evolved in the absence of predation. Uh, one author uh, calls it ecological naivety, which I, <laughs> which I like. It's a nice term. Um, so you can get really close. I mean, you can have these very intimate experiences and interactions right. with animals, uh, both on land and in the water. And sea lions are very playful, and they love to you know, swim around you. And uh, there is absolutely nothing like swimming side by side with a sea turtle or a marine iguana. Mm-hmm. And uh, the geology is also very visible. Uh, there are islands where the geology is has not been covered up by vegetation, so it's just absolutely incredible nature experience. This is One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Coberline. We've been talking with Bob Rothman about the Galapagos Islands. Up next, we'll talk about the larger aspect of science in Chile and the impact it may have on that culture. You went to the Galapagos. I just recently went to Chile to see astronomy, which is another area where you see the kind of geography of the region play an important role in science in the case Mm -hmm. of astronomy because uh, Chile is part of the Andes, has good elevation, clear skies, all of this. And I saw a lot of kind of how the government in Chile tries to coordinate with encouraging astronomy, things like limiting light pollution. And I wondered how Ecuador did the same thing for the Galapagos because I think in both cases, they're natural resources. Part of their economy depends upon yes. this type of uh, process. You know, in Chile, it's astronomy, and in Ecuador, it's the Galapagos. Mm. So how do they deal with this? I mean, it's a, a challenge of... There are two major agencies. There's the National Park Service, and then there's the uh, Charles Darwin Research Station. And they, they tend to work hand in hand. They The research station and the park have joint uh, conservation programs. Mm-hmm. 
The premier conservation program has been the the captive breeding of and release of giant tortoises. So each of the major inhabited islands have breeding stations. They have been very successful. So, for example, one of the islands, uh, the island of Española, was reduced to like 11 or 12 giant tortoises. And they were so scarce that they probably had never seen each other. They had okay. never encountered each other before. There were two males and I think maybe 11, 11 females. And they brought them all to the station and they received another male from the San Diego Zoo, and they have been doing captive breeding for several decades now, and they have released hundreds of tortoises back onto the island. Uh, they have just, in the past month, released 150 tortoises onto Santa Fe Island, which has n- has not had tortoises for for a long time. Uh, they, they have supported genetic analysis uh, to understand the population structures and the migration, the, the migration of the tortoises as they've colonized colonized right. the islands. Trying to preserve the genetic diversity. Try, trying things. to preserve, both trying to preserve it and also trying to understand it. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. There, there are two species of giant tortoises, one on the island of Floriana and one on the island of Pinta that are extinct. The uh, Pinta population just went extinct in 2012. Oh, wow. There was okay. one last surviving male named Lonesome George, and he died, and that was the end of this population. The right. other he one— He was fairly old, right? I mean, I think maybe 70 to 100 70, years old. 70 to 100. The population of Floriana became extinct in the late 1830s, shortly after Darwin visited. But interestingly, over on one of the other islands, uh, on the western side, right adjacent to the— whaling grounds, they have found tortoises that carry the genetic signatures of these two populations. So can they try to restore and, them? And that's, what, that's exactly what they're trying to do. At the main Darwin station, they have pens where they have the baby tortoises, and there is one pen labeled Floriana, and those tortoises are extinct. And I asked about it, and I was told that the parents of these tortoises had something like 85% genetic identity with the Floriana population, so they're actually trying to recover. So they're that. very similar in that sense. So, yeah. Now I know the the uh, the islands are also a UNESCO heritage site. They are a UNESCO heritage site, and and that's from the UN. So that's what is UN. what does that mean? In terms uh, that, that that was uh, the islands were one of the first ten uh, world heritage sites. About seven or eight years ago, I don't remember the exact date offhand. Uh, UNESCO declared that that site endangered. There have been strikes and actually a little bit of violence over the years over the government trying to impose strict uh, limits on fishing mm-hmm. in the islands. And during these times, you hear comments from the strikers and uh, proponents, you know, well, yes, it's, it's a World Heritage Site, but what has that got to do with us? You know, how is that going to help us? Right. So, we have the similar type of thing, you know, yeah. the famous spotted owl of and, and loggers in California or Washington, I think. But yeah. It's nice that my place where I live is pretty or diverse or something, but I have to make a living. Yeah, and it, it doesn't do me any good. Yeah. But they're trying to... Uh, make the experience better. Uh, the, the guides have strict guidelines on what their educational background should be, mm-hmm. although that tends to be weakening in, in the past few right. years. Or, you know, the, the qualifications have become less. Uh, the, the other interesting thing is that Ecuador seems to have a feeling that humans uh, can coexist in nature. And, and I had a very interesting experience uh, a few years ago on the mainland uh, I have a very good friend who was a naturalist guide, and he took me to a park called uh, Chirute Manglares National Park. It, it's this big pond, and it's at the bottom of several hills, and there's a lot of drainage, so the ground is very muddy there. Mm-hmm. And they also allow farmers in there w- uh, with their cows. And the cows walk all over the place, and they, their feet you know, sink right, into the mud, right. create these big potholes everywhere. They're, they're chewing on the, you know, on, on the bark, on the, the trees, and, the bark and, and, and yeah. it's, just, it's, just, it's just a disaster. But they're living together. Uh, but, but they're living together. <laughs> and, you know, this issue is probably better regulated in the Galapagos, uh, but 
it's still an issue. In the past, there are, there are still people poaching on tortoises. There's mm-hmm. illegal there's illegal sea cucumber fishing. Sea cucumbers are a huge market in Asia. Uh, illegal shark finning, illegal lobster catching. Uh, the government, you know, is, is trying to crack down on all of this, but it, there's a lot of tension, and it's still going on. Islands in general are sometimes presented as kind of a cautionary tale in the sense because their ecosystems are so limited. When We can see the kind of evolutionary degradation, if you want to call it that, yeah. the kind of environmental degradation. And I think a lot of people kind of present that as, you know, first came the island and then the rest of the earth. Is that, is that a fair analogy, you think? Well, I, I think that's probably fair. Um, on an island, it's so much more obvious. Mm-hmm. And, and it happens very over a much shorter period of time. On one island, Santiago, when, when Darwin visited, there there was a population of land iguanas, which is you know, one of the premier endemic species in the Galapagos. When Darwin was there, he said there were so many land iguanas that they couldn't find, they, they dig burrows, they couldn't find a place to pitch their tents. <laughs> Today, there's not a single one. Wow. Not a okay. single one. They're totally extinct. It's like the American buffalo. Pretty much. You know, except we kind of restored a little or bit. Or the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon. Yeah. We do know causes of extinction mm. due to humans. Yes. Now, on the other hand, um, believe it or not, uh, there have been several brand new species of a- of animals mm-hmm. discovered in the Galapagos in you know, in the last few decades, so species that weren't there since not we've not not been species there. that were there. But well, uh, there there is one species of land iguana that nobody had ever seen. It was it's very secluded up on top of one of the volcanoes. In fact, it's on the volcano that just erupted oh, okay. at the beginning of summer, and there was a lot of concern about this this population. Turns out that they're they're okay. There are three species of booby in the Galapagos. Um, the blue-footed booby, the red-footed booby, right. and the mast booby. Well, about 10, 15 years ago, it turned out that the mast booby isn't really a mast booby. It is a completely different species, now called the Nazca booby, with oh, a okay. new species name. It's been kind of hiding under our noses because it looks a lot like a bird called the, ma- called the mast booby that's pan-tropical. There is a shearwater. It's a small uh, seabird that had initially been identified as an Audubon shearwater, which is a tropical bird. Turns out it's not an Audubon shearwater. It's a different species. On the central island in the Galapagos, on Santa Cruz, it was thought that there was one species or subspecies, you know, that distinction is not clear, of giant tortoise. Turns out that there are actually two. They, right. they look very similar, but genetically, they show the biggest separation between any tortoises in, in the island, and they right. live almost side by side. So as we do genetic testing, so as, we as, so, find so, the, so the deeper you look at it, the more you find out there are still lots and lots of things to be learned about the process of speciation to identify new species in the Galapagos. Okay. Uh, you'd think that, that the islands are so small, and so many people have been there that we've seen everything, but we haven't. Right. There's always just more to cover. It's just And there's, you, there's a lot that's, down. that's hidden right under your nose that you just don't see. Which is always kind of the case. Yeah. You've been listening to One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Kogerlein. We've been talking with Bob Rothman about the Galapagos Islands. Up next, Bob has some questions for me about Chile and whether the idea of tourism will work there as well as it does in the Galapagos. So my experience with the Galapagos has been largely through student-based tourism. I've been doing Mm -hmm. this since 1990, and it has been a fantastic opportunity for the students. You have just come back from a trip to Chile looking, doing an astrophysical tour. I'm curious how you see that kind of activity uh, as, as a venue for RIT students or, or, or others as well in, term, in terms of astrophysical tourism. Well, I think it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, the, the program that I was part of was actually part of the National Science Foundation. And the idea was to actually connect Americans more strongly with astronomy that's being done in Chile, because about two-thirds of big astronomy is now being done in Chile because of the geography. And so it was a program designed to actually expose people to what's being done in Chile, what the culture is like, and then to bring that back Mm -hmm. To the United States. So doing that with students is is kind of a next logical step. 
And uh, one of the things that you see in Chile is the idea of astrotourism in the same way that you would have ecotourism is actually something that they're very interested in because uh, just as the Galapagos are a natural resource of Ecuador, the Andes are a natural resource of Chile and the uh, high elevation and dark skies and clear skies is actually a benefit for astronomy. The same thing that draws big astronomy to Chile is actually the type of thing that would draw tourists mm -hmm. to seeing the night sky. So how how would a proposed student trip or, or any any tour, uh, tourism trip to Chile work with, in, with respect to astronomy? I think it depends a little bit on what the goals are. Uh, there is a growing area of ecotourism kind of on an amateur scale to see dark skies and to use telescopes that are smaller. But I think for, t for students, you'd also want to connect them to big astronomy. I mean, that modern scientific effort is something that's important. And there are some connections there. I mean, a lot of the big telescopes do have some type of tourism program or visit program that could be utilized. So, you know, you could bring students in and, and expose them to this. One of the challenges is that, you know, the Galapagos are all very central. And Chile is this very long, narrow country. And so, you know, there's hundreds of miles between different telescopes. Yes. I, I said earlier that I found the rainforest very overwhelming mm -hmm. and that you can't go there on a, on a trip and then come back with any kind of cohesive story like you would with the Galapagos. So what is a cohesive story that you would come back with on an a astrophysical tour of Chile? Oh, I think there's a, a couple of things. Uh, one is the idea of what big astronomy means in, in the modern world, that regardless of the telescope, the way big astronomy is done and the way it's going to be done has a common theme in the sense that these are large projects or international projects, and, and they're coordinated through large international uh, organizations. And so being exposed to that, I think, would be one aspect of it. I think another aspect would be how important the culture of astronomy is to the encouragement of big astronomy in Chile. The Chilean government and the Chilean people actually see astronomy as an important aspect of their society, uh, not only because of the economic advantages that it brings, but because they have a tradition of dark skies and of, you know, observing the sky that, that they connect to their own heritage. So what surprised you the most about seeing this, this dark sky? You know, it was, it was fascinating to see skies that dark. I've, I've seen dark skies before, but I've never seen skies so incredibly dark. And, and I've, I've said, you know, the kind of analogy is that they're so dark they're bright because mm -hmm. the sky is so bright that, that it's, it's almost overwhelming. And, and you never really get an opportunity to see skies so clear. But I think the other part of it is how big science and big astronomy has become so much of an international endeavor. You know, there, it, it used to be that there would be, the United States would go down, like at Cerro Tololo, which is one of the mountains where they have telescopes. And it was an American organization working with Chile. And it's managed by the United States. And, and Chile kind of helps on the side. And what's happened over the past decades is that's no longer possible. The, in order to build a, a modern telescope, it's just too expensive, it's too large, it's, it's, it's too much of a risk for one country to kind of go in and control. And so everything now is international, and it's either collaborations through Europe or Europe and the United States and China and, and Japan. These are big telescopes that are done collaboratively. It's much more like the UN. And it's an interesting trend to see on how you have the political dynamics as well as the scientific dynamics. How How is space-based astronomy going to affect all of this? I know there's the Hubble, and I heard mm -hmm. recently that, um, I, I think I heard that there's a, a project afoot to put three telescopes up. I... There are. There's there's always this kind of dream list yeah. of space-based telescopes. So how, how is this going to affect uh, Earth-based astronomy do you think well i think they're going to have different areas that they specialize in i think ground-based astronomy particularly in places like chile and hawaii 
are still going to be around for a long time. We've got a, a lot of, of good technology to overcome some of the challenges like atmospheric distortion, things like that. Uh, and so there's a lot you can do with a ground-based telescope. The other thing is that ground-based astronomy is still going to be cheaper than space-based astronomy by, by a significant amount. You know, the, the, um, the large radio array in the Atacama is about a $1.3 billion project. And that's a large astronomy project. If you look at the Hubble telescope, for example, if I remember correctly, it's like eight or ten billion dollars. So it's still massively more expensive. You know, for the price of one space-based telescope, you're still going to be able to make two or three pretty big ground-based telescopes. Mm -hmm. And that means you can do, you know, long-term observations. You can specialize on specific topics that you couldn't do with a space-based telescope. So what do you see as the uh, possibilities for astrophysical tourism there? How, how would you run, a, run such a trip? I think I would run such a trip by combining the two of, of both astrotourism on a local scale and big astronomy. I'd have a mm -hmm. mix of the two because I think they're both important, both, uh, you know, particularly for a student, educating them in or exposing them to both the cultural phenomena of astronomy and how, how Chile handles that societally, as well as the big science that's done on, you know, with huge telescopes on, on large scales. And uh, I think exposing them to those two would be a really good thing, as well as the Chilean culture and things mm -hmm. like, you know, the Chilean wines and stuff like that. They're very good. Aren't They're they? very good, yeah. Yes. You've been listening to One Universe at a Time. We've been talking with Dr. Bob Rothman, Professor of Biology at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our program is produced by Mark Gillespie with support from the RIT College of Science. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time. Thank you.